You. Number 24, says a curt voice, and Jess is startled right out of the story. Her sandwiches and tea are set on her table, and the worker mutters, Cognone? Apologies for the pronunciation again. Before she goes back to the counter, where responsible customers pick up their orders from the correct place. Jess bites her lip. She does know that phrase. She's heard it enough. That girl. It's not really derogatory, but the only time she's heard it is when her parents were talking to each other in annoyed, hushed whispers. They didn't use her name, but she knew they were talking about her anyway. She glances at the other people in the restaurant. Are they looking down on her too? Looking down on her for not being fluent, not following procedure, not living up to her heritage, any of it. Jess often feels as if she's not Chinese enough in certain situations and not Vietnamese enough in others. It's awkward when you're not quite right one or when you're not quite one but not quite the other. Jess sighs. She takes one sandwich out to eat now and stuffs the other in her backpack. She unwraps the sandwich and takes a bite. The juxtaposition of the crisp baguette and the thin slices of chua lua che Chua lo, chua is perfect with pickled vegetables and jalapenos. There are fr few so can't speak today. I apologize. There are few soy proteins that Jess genuinely enjoys, and the way the imitation chua lua is seasoned, Jess really can't tell it from the meat version. The tai chi is sweet and refreshing, and she not enjoys her meal for a bit before going back to writing. Jess only looks up when she has to stop and unsmudge some of the ink on her left palm and hears a familiar voice. Oh gosh, why did you pick this place? It's so fobby. My mum eats here. Elizabeth Fang and what looks like the rest of the AHHS volleyball team come into the shop and no, no, please no, a flash of reddish gold hair. Yep, it's the entire volleyball team which means Abby Jones, captain of said team, is also with this group, and they're all going to see Jess sitting in the corner eating her sandwich with crumbs all over her face like an absolute nerd. Jess shrinks into herself and pulls her hood over her head. Why are they here? Didn't Elizabeth declare this place incredibly uncool ever since Jess tried to bring up the idea of selling Vietnamese sandwiches as the AHHS Honor Society fundraiser at the Hawk? at the Fall Harvest Festival. Elizabeth's idea to sell cheesecake from the pie factory downtown was voted into the plan. Denise Poe, who Jess doesn't quite mind so much, walks in after Elizabeth and laughs at her comment. Well, yeah, but that's the point. Team dinner means we try something new, and you know you want to give them something authentic and awesome. Elizabeth grumbles, and Jess tries to finish her bite. Jess would leave, but it's raining a lot harder now, and even though the bus stop is right outside, the next one won't be here for another 40 minutes. Jess just hopes that her sweatshirt is inconspicuous enough. She doesn't care if Elizabeth or Denise see her. She's used to teasing with them. The three of them actually used to be pretty good friends. The Asian community is in Andover is close-knit, and their parents had spent them, sent them all to the same Chinese school. Although Jess could speak Cantonese well enough, she'd struggled with Mandarin and Vietnamese, especially the written forms. As there wasn't a Vietnamese language school in Andover, her parents had settled on sending her off to Sacred Heart Chinese Language Academy every Saturday. The school, with students of all ages, from grade school kids still learning their bơ pơ mu first, to older students taking more advanced classes, was not without its clicks. Jess, Elizabeth and Denise were the only three girls in her grade level. The other students, mostly children of more recent immigrants, had formed close friendships already at their Chinese language preschool. Jess felt an immediate bond with Elizabeth and Denise. The trio goofed off during classes. After all, they weren't being graded. They went every Saturday to stay out of their parents' hair and learn a bit of the language and the culture. Jess only went to the language school until seventh grade. She struggled at remembering the hundreds of different characters. It wasn't as if her parents knew the written forms either, and as long as she could talk to them, she felt okay. 
She only kept going as long as she did because she liked hanging out with Elizabeth and Denise. Elizabeth liked making fun of the other, the other students' accents in English, at their fashion choices, at how they were clearly fresh off the boat. And that criticism didn't stop with the other students, or fops, as Elizabeth was quick to call them. But Elizabeth was critical of Jess's everything, from her hair to the clothes she was wearing. Jess was uncomfortable with that. And then one time her mum had been picking her up from the Chinese school with a younger Brendan in the back seat. Brendan was quite precocious, but he didn't care much for fashion. He was wearing three different hats from the colleges that were courting him. Elizabeth was waiting with Jess in the parking lot, and as soon as she spotted Brendan, she started laughing her ass off. Look at that kid! Gosh, he looks like such a nerd. What's up with all those hats? He is a nerd, Jess said hotly, but he's also my little brother, and he's amazingly smart and applying to colleges already. Oh, I didn't know. Sorry. Elizabeth's tone signified that she wasn't really sorry that she'd insulted Jess's little brother, and she went on to criticise someone else. Jess didn't want to go back to the school after that, and then middle school had started, and it seemed Elizabeth and, by default, Denise hadn't wanted to spend time with her anyway. She spent a few lonely lunches by herself, but then she met Bells and Emma and never missed Elizabeth and Denise. Those two went on to join the volleyball team and tried to make the best of their high school career. And Jess, living in Claudia's shadow, gave up participating in anything. <coughs> the varsity volleyball team is rowdy, still in their uniforms. And yep, there's Mrs. Delgado bringing up the rear. They must have just won a game and gone out to celebrate. Jess chances a peek and sighs. Abby is wearing her hair in a high ponytail, and a few errant curls are escaping from it, gently wafting on the nape of her neck. She smiles at one of her teammates and nods at what the other girl is saying, and then gets distracted by the menu on the wall. While the other girls are wrapped up in conversation, Abby looks around the restaurant, and her eyes light up when she sees the colourful, stacked display of pastries and the Vietnamese desserts. She scans the room and then locks gazes with Jess. Jess freezes. She's not invisible, but she should just be a faceless maroon lump in a school sweater. It's the sweater. Abby is smiling. Smiling at her because she recognised the dancing horse, the Mustang's mascot on the sweater. And it's because Abby is nice and school spirit or solid... Oh, God, she's not looking... Oh, good, she's not looking anymore. It's not as if she would have recognised Jess anyway. Jess hastily wraps the rest of her sandwich, stuffs it in her bag, takes another slurp of tea, and dashes out to wait for the bus in the rain. Chapter 3 The next day, Jess ignores the entrees for the school lunch and plates and gets a plate full of tater tots. Emma eyes Jess's lunch and rolls her eyes, and then gives Jess a fresh apple from her bag lunch. Bells gives her half of his peanut butter jelly sandwich from home too. It's not that the food is completely inedible at school, but the government isn't spending tons of money on the public high school lunch program. There are a lot of important things, like running the country, Apologies, I could feel a big cough coming on. I didn't want to dampen everyone. There are a lot of important things, like running the country and making sure that there's going to be enough food and power for everyone. And stuff like defence isn't cheap either. Having strong military is important in case something like the disasters ever happens again. 
idly scrolling through her messages on her DED display. Jess munches on the crispy potato bites. There are a few funny hollows from bells of cats wearing cute sweaters that she or that she saw already, and a whole bunch of notifications from the Captain Orion fan club. She's set up for an alert for anything new about her hero, but usually what she gets is either something she's already seen or the group discussing stuff. She deletes one message after another, and then she blinks, startled. Hey, I got an interview. Bells looks up from his sketchpad. For what? This paid intern internship I applied for at Monroe Industries. Whoa, really? I didn't even know they took high school interns. Is it, like, super competitive? Did you have to write, like, five essays? Emma asks. Are you going to be working with the robots? A mon robot flies by and picks up some trash. The school's able to afford some of last year's models. This one is sleek and efficient, chirping a greeting at the three of them as it passes by. Jess laughs. No, I applied for this office position that was pretty vague, but I don't think they'll let me anywhere near the technical stuff. Probably just boring work, like filing or getting coffee, but a job's a job, and I bet any college will look at Munro Industries and be impressed, right? That's if I get it, though. I bet you will, Belle says. Thanks. Jess types a response, fingers flying through the projected mini keyboard to let them know when she's available after school this week for an interview. By the end of lunch, she has an official message from M that says they want to fill the position as soon as possible and suggesting that if she can't come into the office today, they can do a video interview. Jess high fives Emma and Bells and confirms for five o'clock. Jess gets home from school just as her mother returns from picking up Brendan from the college campus downtown. Dad home today? Jess asks. I want to use his office for a backdrop. I have a job interview via Hollow and I need it to look really professional. Yeah, he's out doing. Mum casts a furtive look to see if any neighbours are listening in. The work, you know. Right, Jess says as she goes inside. I'm sure helping old ladies cross the street is a great purpose. Maybe one day the mistress will show up again. I hope they do. Dad has been so weird about finding hero stuff to do. They're lucky they live in Andover, where the biggest thing to worry about is Master Mischief stealing all the oranges again, or Mistress Mischief turning all the street signs upside down. The Mischiefs aren't class A-class villains. They have C-class powers, just like our parents. They've never harmed anyone, not like Dynamite the cruel and heinous villain in New Bright City. Dynamite was responsible for that awful explosion in that shopping centre. If Captain Orion hadn't been there, the bomb would have destroyed half the region. But without the mischiefs to stir up trouble, there isn't much for a superhero to do. No switcheroos at the art museum, no thefts from local factories, no industrial supplies gone missing, not even strange robots playing pranks on people. The mischiefs are just gone without warning or notice, and that's strange for a couple known for their loud and dramatic stunts. Since they've disappeared, Smasher and Shockwave have no hero work to do, and Li Hua and Victor Tran have had to adapt. Jess's dad has been acting really weird. He goes out of his way to do good deeds, until the mayor asked him to stop helping people cross the street. Jess's mom, on the other hand, really happy about having the extra time to work on her novel, has adapted very well to the lack of hero work. She even put in actual hours at her real estate job. 